Hello, welcome to this tutorial. One of the simplest ways to organize your data is to sort it. You can sort it from high to low or low to high in either direction. But in the end you have a ranked distribution. One of the benefits to a ranked distribution is that you can calculate the range of the data. So if the oldest car is 16 and the newest car is one year, our range would be 16 minus 1, or a range of 15 years. When you have several cars, it may still not be helpful to list all of uh, the ages of those cars. In some cases, it might be better to list instead a, create a simple frequency distribution. With the simple frequency distribution, you have two columns. The column on the left represents each unique response. In this case, each unique response is age of car. So we can see that uh, people have cars that are one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, all the way up to 16 years old. It's possible that someone might not have had a car that was 15 years old. And if so, we wouldn't have seen 15 listed in the leftmost column as a value that occurred. However, in this case, all the uh, possible ages were covered from 1 to 16. In the rightmost column, you're going to see the frequency for each of those responses. So if I look at the bottom row, there's a car that's one year old, and there's only one of them. Uh, in terms of cars that are two years old, there are two people with that. And for cars that are three years old, there are again two people. So the column on the left tells you, the, in this case, the age of the car. And the column on the right tells you how many students have a car of that particular age. So a simple frequency distribution lists each of the responses that occurred, and that's the leftmost column, and then the rightmost column it lists its frequency. With a simple frequency distribution, it's fairly easy to calculate the range as well as to identify the mode. To calculate the range, since a simple frequency distribution lists all the values that occurred from high to low, we can take a look at the top and see the high value, which is 16, and at the bottom of the uh, table the low value one year and calculate that range as 16 minus 1 giving us 15. Also we can identify the mode that is the value that occurred most frequently. So the most frequent response was people reporting that their car was 9 years old. There were 12 people who reported that their car was 9 years old. So a simple frequency distribution further organizes the data making it easy to see for each response how many times it occurred. In this particular case, we're recording the age of cars. If we had gone to the mall and recorded ages of people, we might have gotten unique responses anywhere from 1 to your 1-year-old, all the way up to 99, to the 19-year-old. And with so many possible responses from 1 to 99, our simple frequency table could be extremely long. So long as not really to be much benefit. In fact, the current simple frequency distribution that we have here, talking about car age, it has 16 rows in it. That's pretty long for people to take a look at. In that case, you might instead want to group these values. And this is called a grouped frequency distribution. For the table that you see here, the age of the cars are grouped using an interval size of 3. The bottom class interval shows us that there are are cars that from 0 to 2 years of age, that there's 3 of them. And for cars that are 3 to 5 years in age, why, there's 10 of those. And for cars that are 6 to 8 years old, there are 20. And so on. Each one of these rows is referred to as a class interval. So we have, in this case, 6 class intervals. 0 to 2 is one class interval, 3 to 5 is another class interval, and so on. When you look at the group frequency distribution, that leftmost column is going to be talking about, in this case, uh, the age of cars. That is, we're talking about what were the responses made. So some responses uh, were one year old, and some responses were two years old. And there was three of those cars. What you see boxed are the 0, the 3, the 6, the 9, the 12, and the 15. Those represent the lower apparent limits for each class interval. The 2, the 5, the 8, the 11, the 14, 17, those are the upper apparent limits for each class interval. And finally, the rightmost column, that 
lists the frequency for each of those class intervals. When we look at a class interval, such as cars that are 9 to 11 years in age, there were 30 cars that fell into that class interval. That means when you calculate the frequency of cars that were 9 years old, plus those that were 10 years old, plus those that were 11 years old, there are 30 cars that fell into that class interval. So 9 is the lower apparent limit for the class interval, 11 is the upper apparent limit for the class interval, and 30 is the number of cars in it. You hear this term apparent limit. Apparent limit means that the limits are in the same unit as the measurement. That is, when we ask people how old their cars were, we asked how many years old. And so our limits that we're providing, the 9 is the lower limit, and the 11 is the upper limit, those are the apparent limits. They're in the same unit as uh, the values that report it, the reported in years. Well, when it's time to create your table, you're going to want to make sure that you labeled your columns. Notice that my leftmost column is labeled age of car. This is where I'm going to be uh, putting the survey responses, one year, two year, and so on. The rightmost column is labeled number of cars, and that's the number of cars that are in each class interval. And your table should also have a title, and this is uh, how old are the cars. When you create a group frequency distribution, you want to select an interval size that will provide between 5 and 11 class intervals. This particular table, if you count each of the rows, has 6 class intervals. Anything um, less than 5, it's hard to identify any real patterns. And anything more than 12, it starts to become unwieldy. So somewhere between 5 and 11 is ideal so that you can uh, identify any possible patterns in the data itself. Okay, what we're looking at right now is all the data as a ranked distribution. And you can see it's still fairly overwhelming to see all the data listed out there as opposed to the simple frequency distribution we looked at earlier, uh, and especially the group frequency distribution uh, helped us to identify patterns much more easily. But we're looking at the ranked distribution here because we want to find out what is the range of our data. And our ranked distribution gives us the high value and the low value. And so we can calculate the range as 15. That is, there's a span of 15 years. Now we want to choose a, an interval size that will give us somewhere between 5 and 11 class intervals. And there's no easy solution to this. Literally say, OK, if my range was 15. What if I divide it by 2? How many class intervals would I get? 7.5? Well, that could work. It's between 5 and 11. What if I use an interval size of, thir of, of 3? Well, 15 divided by 3, that would give me approximately 5 class intervals. Well, that's good. Now, what about um, 15 divided by 4, if my interval size was 4? Well, that would give me 3.75 class intervals. And again, that, that would be too small in this case, because it would be less than the 5 to 11 range we want. We're going to go ahead and work with the class interval size of, of 3. That groups up the uh, years and uh, is within that 5 to 11 range. On an exam or test, most likely I will be giving you the interval size directly. Okay, so we know we're going to work with the interval size of 3. Well, what will be the limits for our bottom class interval? What will be our lower limit? What will be our upper limit? Well, here's an important thing to remember any time that you create a group frequency distribution. You want it to be readable. You want it to be easily understandable. And an important way to achieve this is to make sure that your lower apparent limits for every class interval, that there are multiples of the interval size. OK, so our interval size is 3. So that means our lower apparent limit needs to be something like a 0, or a 3, or a 6, or a 9. Some value that's a multiple of 3. That's where we need to start. OK, so we're back at our rank distribution. I'm looking at all the data. And I'm going to focus on the smallest value. Well, the smallest value is 1. That is, there was a person who reported their car was only 1 year old. Now, my bottom class interval needs to include that value of 1 within, within the range. I can start with 1 as my lower apparent limit if it's a multiple of 3. But 1 is not a multiple of 3. 0 is. 3 times 0 is 0. 3 is. 3 times 1 is 3. 6 is. 3 times 2 is 6. But 1. One is not a multiple of three. So literally, I say, OK, my lowest value is a one. Is it a multiple of three? Nope. And so I try the next smaller number. What about zero? Is zero a multiple of three? Yes. And then I can stop. 
If zero hadn't been a multiple of three, I would try for the next smaller value. What about negative one and negative two? I would just work all the way down until I finally found a multiple of three. So that's the that's the key thing to, to remember. You take your lowest value and you say, is it a multiple of my interval size? And if it is, you're good to go. And if it's not, you say, well, what about one less than my smallest value? And you just work your way down um, until you find something that is a multiple. All right, so back to the group frequency distribution. My lower apparent limit for that bottom class interval is zero, right? The uh, youngest car was uh, one years old, and that wasn't a multiple uh, of three. Zero was, so we started with zero. And that's important to remember because often the easiest mistake for anyone to make is to say, well, one's my lowest value, so I'll start with one. But the problem is you end up creating a table that's not as easy to read. And yes, I know that if you start with zero, and there are no cars that are zero, zero years old, you might say, well, why am I doing that? And the benefit, again, is that you're going to end up creating a table that's much more readable by doing so. Okay, so a bottom class interval, uh, zero to two. Notice it's zero to two because there's zero, there's one, and there's two. So that's interval size of three, right? Zero, one, two, zero, one, two, that's three there. And how many uh, cars are between zero to two? There's three of them. Well, at this point, I know that um, all of my class intervals, that the lower parents will be multiples of three. So if my bottom uh, class interval, the lower parent is a zero, from next class interval up, it's going to be a three, and next one up, it's going to be a six, next one up, it'll be a nine, and then a 12, and a 15. And that's one of the things that you can just kind of check after you've created a group frequency distribution. Just look at those lower parent limits and say, are they all multiples of my interval size? And if they are, you're good to go. Keep going on, and if they're not, stop and figure out uh, what you might do instead. Then you can go ahead and finish creating your group frequency distribution. And again, as you look at this, you can see that the lower parent limits are all multiples of three. And because you know your multiples of three, this table is much uh, easier to read. You can see that it starts uh, with zero to two and goes all the way up to 15 to 17. The oldest car was actually only 16, but again, we're going to go to 17 because our interval size is 3. You list all the class intervals, beginning with the smallest, 0 to 2, all the way up to 15 to 17. If a middle class interval had a frequency of 0, you would still put it in there. You just say its frequency was 0. Would I ever want a class interval that was 18 to 20? No. Since that's above the uh, eldest car, so to speak, it, it would be of no benefit to add a bunch of class intervals above that were all zeros. So you begin with the class interval containing your minimum value, and you stop when you get to the class interval containing your maximum value, making sure that your lower parent limits are all multiples of the interval size.